a pleasure to be back here again. I think today, I hopefully I will rush through a lot of things, but touch on some of the topics that have been dear to me for many, many years. And I titled the, the talk, Old Dog's New Trick, because I am, in many ways, old dog. So let's get this started. Okay. Uh, one thing that I always find is, you know, in, in today's Silicon Valley here, living in Silicon Valley, you know, things are always new. And being an old guy, I think O is new in many ways. And I think for many people who reach a certain point in life and they just continue doing the same thing over and over again, there's nothing new. But if you reinvent yourself every day, I'm a real believer that you come, wake up every day and you do something completely different. So I'll go through some of my experience and try to relate to the issue of technology, creativity, and people. Okay, so just to show you that I'm old, you know, I started out, my first program was actually on the PP8. I broke into a school computer lab in one of the summer program I had, and I learned programming by actually committing something that I shouldn't have done, but that's how I learned programming. So I started way in the early days, and over the years, and this is the first early days of my years, I went through a lot of evolution early days of per computing and, and, and the change there. I was there the day when Steve Jobs introduced Apple to the, Mos uh, the, the convention center, it wasn't the Moscone, but the convention center in San Francisco. So I still remember those early days of microcomputing. Actually, I was the first head of the microprocessor special interest sphere in IEEE in Silicon Valley. A little bit of trivia there, but that's another story altogether. Okay, so I started out, you know, in the technology and making picture. I started a company after I worked three years as an engineer at HP, and I worked in combining technology and creativity because my background is art and technology. So I used that combination to build tools that make picture. So that's where I came from. So I spent many years in a company that was very successful in doing animation, visual effects, and various things like that. Actually, you can look at my old talk, which talks about all this, so I won't talk much about it. Eventually, we made the movie Shrek, part of DreamWorks. So that, that's my background, combining technology and creative people in working together in solving complex problems. We had to invent a lot of these technology. And, you know, I worked, uh, while I was DreamWorks, I helped set up operation in Hong Kong for doing a TV series which will lead to some of the other things I talk about later, as well as help DreamWorks set up the initial Indian operation. So I spent many years traveling back and forth to multiple countries, learning a lot about different culture and technology and the skill set of the people there. And I was very much instrumental in helping launch those efforts overseas. And I, I had a very different philosophy about it than most people, but we'll get into that more later. And so my history is going from building entertainment business using technology, you know, my our first computer there and PP1144, all the way to the year I left, 2008. And uh, in fact, one of the program I wrote in 1982 actually survived me exiting the company in 2008. Actually, they didn't shut it down to 2012, which made it a 3 year old program that I wrote for rendering back images. So, which I thought, that's another story altogether. So, okay. So after I left, then the question is, what's next, right? And that's why I use the phrase, O is new, right? When we first, when I first started in uh, creating the company to make computer graphics, the technology didn't really exist back then, right? We had to sort of invent everything, the tool. You couldn't buy the tools, you know? The only thing we got was a sort of a version of Linux, uh, Unix back then, and we had a C compiler, right? There were two books in the whole market at that point, how to, program in C, so we, you know, learn programming, and you sort of say, hmm, okay, here's a tool now, but that's not the solution. The solution was to make picture, but there weren't software to make pictures. So you had to go through that whole thinking process of building a company with people who never done any of this stuff before to create something that doesn't exist, right? And that's the challenge of entrepreneurial spirit that what people call today, but back then, it's just out of shared necessity, right? You have to do it, there's no other way. You have a vision, you wanna do something, and you have to create the path to that vision. There's no path to follow. So after leaving, after all these years of having done that, just very successfully, and thanks to DreamWorks, we you know, made all these very successful movies. And I think we made like 10 feature films by the time I left. Um, so what's next, right? 
And just to reflect on that, right, in the early 80s when we started, the world was changing, right? And, you know, a lot of things became available at that time, like the first home video game, right? The first PC and internet. Wow, that was a new thing back in the early 80s when we started. And it's so incomprehensible today to think that that stuff didn't exist when we started, right? But they didn't. So that was a real experience of going through all that, taking advantage of that and put it to good use, right? So now I'm, as I'm leaving the company in 2008, the world's also changing, right? 2008, most of you now remember 2008, hopefully. And that's when social media started to take off. You know, iPhone got introduced at that point, then Android started in 2008. So the, we were another one of these cusps where everything is changing, right? And that's what's great about being around here is everything's always changing. So you sort of look at that and you say, okay, based on the past experience of things changing, how are you gonna take advantage of that? So I went out and started a company called CloudPick. And CloudPick is sort of a technology uh, service company. We're trying to build some technology that we think is innovative. And we wanted to look at the problem from a whole different perspective. I'm not here to sell you all that detail, but that's what I came out to do. I left the company and I said, okay, how can I reinvent myself today and take all the knowledge I have and put it to good use? Oops. So challenges, what are the challenges facing the world back then, right? The world at that point was facing a lot of change in terms of market scale and budget, right? The, in the, the innovation led to, the, the in, that brought upon the industry with these changes, like with mobile device and all that, changes the dynamic of the market completely, at least from my perspective, coming from the entertainment field, right? That's the area I'm most familiar with, so I can only speak from that perspective. You know, in our industry, we had limits, right? I think of any industry, you have certain limits. And you have to always recognize these hard limits, right? I just use this example to illustrate the thinking that go into reinventing yourself. You have to understand certain limits. In the entertainment business, we have what we call 52 weeks limits. Only 52 weeks you can release movies. And in reality, it's probably only 30 somewhat good ones, because most of, a lot of these weekends are not great weekend to release movie. So there are hard limits. How many big hit movie can we be produced every year because there are a limited number of weeks. We have the 24-hour rule, right? Hey, let's, let's say we move to the next stage where we, you're buying DVD or you're streaming video, right? So don't forget streaming video didn't exist when I, you know, really in large scale back then. And you do have the 24-hour limit. You know, as a, last time I checked, I only still live 24 hours a day and I still sleep a certain number of hours. Seem to be fewer every day, but there's a limit to how much time you can spend being entertained, right? These are hard limits. And then and when you sit in the theater, there's a limit. It's 90 minutes about the length you want to sit in the theater. You know, you might have some epic film that will be longer than that, but nevertheless, there's a certain limit to how you produce content. And then now as the mobile device came about, the limit's changing drastically, right? You're now on the move. You're looking at things in a very short time frame. You're on your phone and, you know, back then we didn't have tablet, so you race on phone, and then a few years later, a tablet came along, and people are now much more mobile in terms of how they use entertainment. So now you're working at a much smaller time frame. And within this limit, you know, one thing that really impacts is the cost, right? And, and these are the driving force, right? With any business, you have to look at the driving force behind it to define where you're going. So in animated film, we used to make film for like, well, actually, that's low nowadays. Millions of dollars per, per minute, right? On the high-end feature film we, we make is like one or two million dollars per minute production cost, right? And TV, we're like tens and $10,000, thousand dollars $50,000 range. But then in the mobile space, that budget doesn't work because there's so much more content, right? And so much more channel. There's a signal-to-noise ratio problem at some point. And then you have to really figure out that you need to get down to under $1,000 per minute to produce content for that new, this new space that people are in. And that's a big dilemma. Think about it, right? If, if I'm doing a business and I say, hey, I can do it for twice as good, a half the cost, you're very competitive, right? You can do, say, I can do it for one-tenth the cost, you're disruptive. But here we're talking a range change of three orders of magnitude, okay? That will require fundamental shift in how people think, how people behave, and how people look at the market. 
And then, well, how's that market changing, right? So, and then I won't, I'll skip through some of these. There's all these fundamental issues about where the money's coming from, you know, offshoring, cheap labor, all that other issue. I won't get into that. Okay. And in this new world, we, it, we're dealing with the new media. So this is a sort of driving force from what I'm familiar with. And in the traditional media, you're dealing with film, games, and things that take a long time. We, we had movies that took six, seven years to make, right? And you know, we, we were good. The actual production part, we can get under one year if we need to. But it, they're very expensive. They take a long time. And there's a long release cycle. Right. When I release a film, I'm making it for a mass market. And like a lot of product in the past were made for mass market. You package it really nice, you put it on the shelf, you hope people buy it. At the end, you look at your sale, receipt, you look at your numbers, how it's doing in different market, you do some planning, and in the future, you would produce a better market, a better market and better product, right? But in the, and they have long tail, right? As we all know, the long tail is going away very quickly. And then the mobile media market, you're doing both linear and nonlinear because people are no longer are sitting still. They're interacting. They're changing their mind constantly. And you, and you, instead of having years in development, things are months or weeks in development. You're, you need a very low production cost because you constantly have to be changing it. And now what you have is something that fundamentally changes how content are created. Because now we finally get real-time feedback on how individuals are dealing with the content. I think that's one of the biggest change that I think the whole world's trying to understand and deal with. And now we're delivering live products. Instead of putting something on the film that get released to the theater that we hopefully count the box office and then you know, figure out how to, if we make a sequel or not, now you know in real time how your audience is reacting to your content. That basically have changed how we think about each, each one of you. You're no longer a black box. I mean, from my perspective as a content creator, the audience is no longer a black box. I'm dealing with you not as a mass audience, but as, as individual, right? As all the big companies are finding out, now we're dealing with individuals, not a, you know, just a black box out there. And that, that's the coolest thing there is now we can take an idea and bring it directly to the consumer, right? All the people in Detrina are no longer part of the equation. Right, as a content creator, I can create something, deliver it directly to you, get your feedback. And so that's required you to now take a lot more effort to sustain that, right? If I change, if I see that you don't like something, I have to change it. If I don't change it, you're gonna leave, right? I don't have the luxury of saying, well, I'll count up more heads and I'll decide what to do tomorrow. But if you see it and you suddenly turn me off, you don't like certain things, I need to react to that quickly. And I think that's the biggest shift the industry is going through right now in terms of creating content. There's amazing pipelines out there for delivery, right? Everybody out there got, you know, their version of Netflix or, or, or delivery system, but what's missing is the right infrastructure to creating the content that react to the consumer fast enough. So to do that, uh, old model, you know, also some marketing style eyes here is market driven and is very independent in the market. The new model is big data driven, right? You're looking at data from the real world in real time. And now we're moving into this world of crowdfunding, right? That's, uh, I won't touch that topic because that's much more complex than what I need to deal with. Let me suddenly go back with. Okay, in media platform, we always have content management system. You know who, when, what, and where people are watching stuff. And then when we brought in the big data, Stuff, start collecting info. Now we have identity, we have community, and we have an ecosystem, right? That's what social media have done with the big data infrastructure. That's what Google, Facebook have done, is now providing the next media platform. And now beyond that, we have the analytics behind all that. And now you can now have the social behavior graph. Now you have far in, more in-depth understanding of your consumer of content. So that's where the content industry is going. And then and we're struggling to understand it. Because it's changing so fast compared to where the industry been. Right, the filmmaker hasn't changed how they made film for a very long time, but in the last ten years, the evolution of the media pipeline and the technology that behind it is fundamentally giving people a new opportunity to readdress that field. So the production model traditionally is a very studio-centric model, right? 
one studio hiring people, different project, you know, very vertical traditional structure. But now with the new model, you have the user who are now participating in project working for different virtual studio. So it's sort of been turned upside down. Right? Any one of us can be a content creator. There's no more restriction other than you know, your ability or you find the right people. You can peanut and produce content pretty easily. I mean, I mean obviously there's a com how people commoditize that and how the, what's the revenue model, but I, I think we start to see that evolving to a point where people now realize that if they produce the content at the right price point and constantly renewing it, it creates a sustainable ecosystem. And I'll slip some more company marketing slide. The interesting thing is, instead of seeing this traditional studio model, when I started Cloud Pick the company, we think about the model as pretty much a mesh model. I'm not, for me, I used to chose the company named Cloud Pick, but then I realized it's sort of backward from how the rest of the world think about it. The rest of the world, Cloud is somebody really having a big infrastructure out there in a big room somewhere. That's the world, mostly the definition of Cloud computing. Uh, my thinking always been cloud computing is all of us banding together with the cloud. There's no real infrastructure. I don't have to pay that cost. So, so I'm a little bit on a different perspective, but I won't get too much into that. So the challenge now to address that is better, faster, cheaper, right? This used to be a joke in our industry. We always say you can at best get two out of three. Right, you can be better, you can be faster, but you can't be cheaper. You can be faster and cheaper, you can be better. Can't have it all. But now, because of this new media, new medium, we need to be all three. So this been the last, since I started my company, outside of the big studio model, is to understand better how to accomplish all three. And through that is what taken me out Side my comfort zone into the realm of working with studio all over the world and, and understanding better the dynamics of how that all fit together and how to connect people together, right? Because you really can't afford to build this really large company anymore, right? Because you can't be better, faster, and cheaper when you have a really big building with a lot of computers sitting inside and a lot of people on a payroll. So the question is how do you address that market? So the first thing is understand a little bit of scale, right? One thing you learn when I learned, you know, at the big studio is you see the world market and you understand, you know, when you read this film, $100 million in the US, $200 million outside worldwide, what does that mean? How many, how big the audience is and so forth. But when you start looking, I was invited to a talk back in April in 2002 to give a talk in China by the Chinese government on CCTV and talk about the digital content industry. And that was quite an eye-opening for me. My first visit to China, actually very early in my life, it was 1978, I mean my first trip, trip to China. And most people here probably have no memories of China in 78. And even if I should describe it to you now, you wouldn't believe how different it is than it is today, 1978. And actually I have a book on computing from China back then that I will, that's another talk altogether. Um, so back then I realized that China is a very large market, right? There's billions of people. And I remember sitting down with head of children television for lunch from CCTV and she said, look, I have 800 million youth. If you just, in their lifetime, you can extract one US dollar from each of them, you have a successful business. So the scale is very different, right? So it's so, so obvious to jump to this conclusion and say, wow, hey, there's a huge market. It, then you can, you know, that's the market to be in. But it's not so trivial as, as everybody's finding out. Right back in April 2002, I visited all these studios in China. A lot of funding from the government building all these studios, but most of them were empty. It was sort of amazing. They had all the latest equipment and, uh, because they want to expand. The government really want to encourage people building into these new areas of technology and all the new. But what was missing was the people component, right? As I think people will look, one of the key thing of this talk is the importance of having, understanding the importance of people in the equation when you're trying to scale to any new market, evolve in any new industry. And then in 2012, I actually took a tour through China and they saw that they even 
went way beyond my expectation, building cities and blocks and buildings everywhere to accommodate this industry that can't quite fill all that space. Because it's easy to build a building, but it's harder to have the people with the right skill and the right knowledge. And, and I always joke, say, hey, you know, you spend half the money on people, you'd be amazing, right? But they had all the infrastructure. It was, it was just, it was there, but it, the content didn't flow out like they would expect it because there wasn't the depth of experience there. Okay, scale was sort of an interesting number from China too. I remember this, I got this from Sly from a talk, a talk about a year ago. And, and you know, back then, you know, this is an amazing number, right? There were 564 million internet users at the end of 2012. This is an old number. And 75% are mobile. And then, you know, you have people doing a billion RMB online transaction within a year. And one site had over a billion hit in a year. I remember a friend of mine, ran into a friend of mine, because I got to meet a lot of very interesting entrepreneur in China. He said, you know, initially we copy all the technology from the US. But now we reach a point that copying that technology is no longer valuable because you have not hit the scale we have hit. So what solution you have came across worked very well in the state. We're beyond that in scale. So it created a whole different set of problems. Okay. So now we're getting to the, some of the meat of what I want to talk about is the challenge of how you go about doing a global business. I'll use my personal experience working in Asia to sort of relate to my journey and how technology and people work together in this new space for me is the digital content space. But hopefully some of that will translate to how technology and people work together in other areas as well. So let's first talk about technology. Okay. In a lot of developing country in the 80s and 90s, they were playing catch up, right? There was a big void. Um, they didn't have a lot of the things we had because we had a head start, right, in the US. You know. So it was very easy to fill that void because there's nothing there. I mean, just like I'm the first guy in the, on the block to, to make hot dog, nobody ever seen a hot dog before, I can slap anything in between two buns and probably do pretty well. So a lot of people filled that void very quickly and became very successful. Because in very fast development environment, you get a lot of that opportunities, and people seize that opportunity and they fill that void very well. So people became very successful in a lot of industry. And so you run into a lot of company and people who are very hardworking and very successful, they fill the void. But that doesn't mean they have the same depth of knowledge and experience that we might be used to here in, you know, in, in Silicon Valley. So, but in some way, I've seen that before here as well. I remember in the bubble during 1999, we had a similar situation where we have so many companies expanding so quickly in the in, in initial boom, the internet. I remember visiting a company during some company meeting as a guest and watching the crowd in the room. I realized most of the people in that room have no idea what that company did, did for a living, right? Six months later, they were all gone. All right, that was 1999. In some sense, I think, in country that grew very quickly, you suffer from some of those challenges, right? Where you suddenly boom, then everybody filled the void, but not never necessarily everybody had the right depth of experience to now carry that forward. And that's a challenging issue for a lot of the, a lot of the company. In, in throughout Asia, historically, Japan had always been able to kept up with the US in the, you know, in the 70s, 80s in technology. Because they, their period of rapid growth and, and growth happened much earlier, in the 50s and the 60s. But in some ch challenge, it's been a challenge for Japan as well to say that. I mean, a few years ago, I opened a studio in Japan, and I worked there, and I worked for many projects there. And culturally, they have been very successful in building very large enterprise, right? like the Sony and various other companies there. But one challenge there is how can they adapt to changes, right? And one, one, uh, I, I will convey one story. I remember meeting with a bunch of game designers. I said, 
And this is as we're moving into the mobile space. I said, look, we need to build this new game and look at the analytics. And I, by the way, how are you going to do analytics? And this guy looks at me directly and he said, look, oh, no problem. It's easy. The consumer is just going to fill out the survey form and mail it back to us. Right? That, they, that, that some people were hit this point of success and they didn't move with the time. They got stuck, right? And that's something that I think a lot of people fall into that trap easy because you hit success, particularly in, I think, in Asian culture. I'm Asian myself, born in Hong Kong, grew up in the States. But you, you sort of reach that plateau where you go, oh, I'm very successful, I don't need to move forward and relearn things anymore. Then you sort of got stuck in this old thinking. And I was just astonished that he would give me that answer. It was like 2012 or something like that. And I realized that you, in today's world, you can't stop learning, right? I, my, my goal is every day I wake up, I learn something new. But, but a lot of people don't do that. So, and when you work in a different culture, you have to realize some people think that way because they have been successful. There's no need, reason to change. And it's, it's a, quite a learning experience. Okay, and the other thing too, with a lot of the technology area I've dealt with, what I've learned is people there are very bright and very smart. I mean, Stanford here have a lot of students from China and they're all very hardworking, very smart students. But one thing I think because they grew so quickly, they didn't have that depth of knowledge, right? Because I had, you know, 30 some odd years to learn a lot of my knowledge, to accumulate that over time. But most of, they, I think they compressed it and probably less than 50% of the time we had to learn the same amount of things. So in some way, they are master of chapter one and two of a book really well, and probably better than I, you know, any of us could. But they didn't have time to get through the end of the book and what's beyond it. So the knowledge is really good on the initial phase, but haven't quite reached the depth of experience and knowledge to deal with the more complex issue. So you see a lot of cases where you run into a lot of uh, technology people in the Asia, where they're really good at the stuff that basically needed to get things going. But when the problem gets to be more complex, you have to almost look for some student that had been educated in the West or came to school in the US or someplace or Europe or somewhere, where they have had learned from other people who have that depth of experience and knowledge. And you know, I don't want to generalize, but that in the last eight years that I've been dealing with uh, people in technology in Asia, I've seen that quite a bit. Uh, but you know, but, the, but but once you start training them, it's not a problem at all. In fact, I'll give you some very strong success story later on about how I you know that that actually worked out very well. Okay. Now the next thing is creativity, right? One one thing in being Asian. One thing I can say is creativity is a difficult topic, to, to, to say the least, to even discuss. Because in a lot of culture in Asia, creative, creative work is not seen as value as much as, you know, working as a doctor or an engineer or something like that, right? An artist is, look, in some culture, actually looked down upon even though they do value art, but the, if you're doing jobs, I mean, okay, I had an artist came to me once in a certain country. He came to me and said, look, I can't continue working in your studio because if I continue to work here, I will not find a wife and my parents would be very unhappy. I would have to go back to find a job working in some big firm because the cross, the need to cross creativity and Technology is essential in, in the industry now, in the t entertainment industry, right? Because everything's digital. And it's really need people who can think from both perspectives. I've spent my lifetime trying to get people to cross that intersection together, right? I always, been, I always say I'm at the crossroad of technology and creativity, and I've been you know, serving as traffic cop in that intersection for many years, trying to get people to work nice together. And that's always been an important part of the success, in, in at least my experience, of getting people from the, the technology end, the creative end, either getting them to work together or getting them to switch role. And that's a challenge that I think is still very difficult in uh, 
in, in Asian country. Uh, you go to, you know, I used to, we used to do a lot of recruiting in big university, even in the U.S. in the early days, right? In the 80, early 80s, it was a problem even here, right? We used to do these, what we call blind dates. We would go in there and go re do a recruiting trip. We'll set up these luncheons. We'll invite engineering professors with art prof arts department professor and put them in one table and have a lunch, right? We call those blind dates. And what's great about that, you get them to, to see each other's from a very different perspective and learn from each other. In today's world, in the technology world, what we all need more is more creativity, right? There's only so many angry birds you can make. So what's important is, it, 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 today more than any time in the past, we need the two sides to be really working on the same table. And I think in the US we have done an excellent job of facilitating that. I think in Asia, is still a lot of certain stigma in terms of people from technology and art department not being on the same table. So that's been a real challenge for me. I mean, I go there, I work with the technologists because I, you know, I try to develop a lot of new innovative technology for creating content to meet that cheaper, faster, better objective. But in the meantime, to deal with creative people as well. And having, again, playing that traffic cop, I think is a challenge out there. And the other thing too, is from a much more structured environment, like Asian environment, you tend to have a much more vertical structure. To be in a creative environment, you need people to have a voice. And to have a voice, you need to be able to speak out and see something good or bad and say something, right? Creativity is not dictated by any individual in a collaborative environment. And one of the big challenges there is getting people to speak up. I remember I was in a big city in Asia, in Shanghai, actually, in this case. I was visiting a studio, and I was looking at the work, and I, I did an experiment. It was somewhat cruel, but I did it anyway. I asked the director, I said, can you put up your worst work on today's dailies? Dailies when the whole team get together and look at the work. I said, put up your worst work. So they put up, I go, why would you want to do this? So it was just, just, just humor me and put up your worst work today. So he put up his wor worst work for the day, you know, because every day you go shoot a film, you make something, you have a lot of daily footage to look at, you put up your work and everybody listens to your direction to improve things. So I asked the director, put up your worst stuff. So he put up the worst stuff. First thing that come up is this atrociously bad stuff, right? Because, you know, like movie making is about selecting the best, all right, out of a bunch of bad stuff. So we put up the really bad stuff, and I looked at the, the audience. This is all professional artists looking at the work, and you can see in their face, they know it. This stuff really sucks, right? Really bad stuff. But nobody would say anything. All right? that, that's, that's part of the culture challenge, right? Because they all see it. You can see it in the face, but because they don't want to upset the boss, they don't want to upset the director, they chose not to say anything, right? And in building an environment where you do want to be collaborative, you want to be breaking new grounds, you need to hear it from everybody, right? I remember when we started in the beginning, one of the key aspects is my job as the leader or co-leader of a company is not to tell you what to do because I have no idea what I'm doing, right? Because we're doing something that's never been done before. If, I, if you have the way for me to tell you and we're not all looking at it from a, with an open mind and perspective to correct it, improve it, and, and learn from it, then we're not building a team, right? I actually will get into the team aspect in a little bit. But so it's important to get people to have a voice. Having a voice to say what you think, what you see is important. You may not be right, right? But it's through the mistake we learn and improve. So it's important everybody learn to become a voice. I used to, when we trained animator, I used to do something terrible to the animator. We used to put animator through improv class. Right? Here's the kids out of school, shy artists, never been in front of a crowd before. And you put them in an improv class, and they have frightened to death. But it helps them communicate. Because at the end, the success of my work, I actually learned this from Steven Spielberg. He told me once when I was work, did a project for him. He said, Richard, if I had to give you all the right answer, then we will never be successful. The only way I'm successful is all of the people that work with me, for me, participate in creative solution, right? And that was a great lesson. 
So I think it's really important when you work in a different culture to learn to break that barrier down to make sure everybody do have a voice and you do listen and give them an opportunity to speak up and seeing things that doesn't work. Yeah, this is not so easy. This is actually, for me, been personally a very challenging problem to get people to think out of the box. Okay, so next is the issue of management, right? Um, having run, so I've built startup from ground up, and you know, from the U.S. side and the Silicon Valley side, I have certain expectation and a certain way of thinking that I thought, hey, this would be great. We put a bunch of people together, problem solve, right? Because in Silicon Valley, you can pick, walk down the street, pick any small group of people. You can probably do very well once you can work, figure out how to work together. And from an environment where there's a little different history, a little different background, a different culture that not necessarily work the same. And a lot of it has to do with how people perceive your management, right? One of the key aspects about management is management has to be understood not just from the manager perspective, but from the employee. Expectation has to be clear in both directions. I need to know what my role is as a manager, and I need to be able to communicate that, articulate it to the team very clearly. And the team also have to understand clearly what their expectations for management and what they're expecting from them. That, that communication has to work both ways. But oftentimes you find in, in Asian country, because this is traditional thinking, it's the manager, it's the boss. You know, he's the big guy. You know, he comes in, he tells everybody what to do, and you never question that, right? And for creative environment, where you're trying, taking on new problems that have never been dealt with before, that doesn't work, right? The boss doesn't know what they're doing. Oftentimes you have people starting business because they made some money doing something else, right? Especially in some developing country, right? Some of the small developing country. Some guy may have made a lot of money because he was in real estate, right? He made a ton of money. He said, hey, I got tons of money. I'm gonna be a tech in the giant now. So he goes and he jumps in, he throws his money down, buy a brand new building, hire all these people. And everybody's looking at him going, okay, you're gonna tell us what to do now, but the guy never done this before, right? He's not gonna be able to tell you what to do. But then you get into this problem of where the expectation of management being able to articulate and tell you your, each of your job, what it's supposed to be, doesn't happen. So that starts to fail, right? And, and that's a big challenge, right? Because in the US, we, do, we have a lot of startup company and the people who build it from the ground up usually knows so, uh, at least be aware of a lot more of the issue and be able to direct the team very well. And you see that in Asia. A lot of the startups are very smart people. They build the company from the ground up. But you get a lot of people who didn't build a company from the ground up, and you run into this problem of people sitting there waiting for the manager to tell them what to do. And they, they take management very literally, right? They, ex they expect management to be able to dictate to them. A lot of it comes from many years of being in the manufacturing business, because manufacturing, usually you have a process that's very well defined. You know, your jobs do A, your jobs do B, your jobs do C. And it's very well defined, so it's easy to dictate that. But when you get into more, a newer area where you have to be more creative, re reinventing the work you're doing every day, that process start to not work, and then, the, then you have to sort of rethink that whole, th whole process. Okay, and one of the key things in management is you know, understanding the, inf the structure, right? I, I came from a school where I think my job as manager is to actually support the people that work for me. My job is to make you successful if you're working for me, not the other way around, right? I remember in, in, when I first went to Asia, interviewing for executive assistant, right? I said, at the end, you know, she had two master degree, a sec executive assistant, right? Came in interview for a job. I looked at her resume, I go, I'm shaking. I go, like, wow, two master, you know, I, I barely survived school. And, and after a long time, I said, what if I were to ask the last boss you had, what, you, what have you done that made you good at what being an executive assistant? She looks up at me and she goes, oh, he'll tell you that I was good, not only bring him tea, but I bring him cookie. I go like, what the heck? Then I realize there's certain expectation 
in some of these management structure of what people below them do for the person above, right? And I have it, maybe I had it all backward, right? Because I also thought, like, hey, my job as manager is to make sure that whatever you need to be successful, I find that for you. And or if not, I find a workaround to make sure you're successful, right? Only way a big company can be successful is all the employees are successful, not because the boss is successful, because one person can't do squat, right? When you're trying to build a big enterprise. So, and that was an interesting learning experience, right? And, and so sh learning to understand that difference was also lead to another eye-opening perspective is that everything's on, carry on the weight of the person at the top. The pro person at the top is expected to carry all the responsibility. Distributing responsibility was a very difficult thing. I had, you know, I, had, I worked with large companies, small companies, different size. And I always believed that the responsibility should be pushed down as far as possible so people have ownership of the problem, right? And oftentimes I run to working in a company in Asia is people don't want that responsibility. They say, well, that's your job as the boss to take that responsibility. Right? But if you don't have an ownership of responsibility, you don't have that passion. I I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm come from a creative end, so I sort of have this you know, belief that it doesn't matter what job, technology or not. Right? I did spend three years in engineering at HP, so I do have some engineering management training. Is that you've got to be passionate about what you do. Right? No matter if you're writing a program, designing an RF amplifier, or you know, painting a, making a drawing or painting or making a movie, if your heart is not into it, you will not do work that exceed people's expectation, right? To be successful, you have to exceed people's expectation. To do that, you have to make sure people have the right motivation. If their job is just to please the boss, that's not a motivation, right? So you have to create an environment that get people to think about, why am I doing that? How do I, you know, get passionate about what my work is. And that's a challenge. I think in moving to any foreign location or any new company, it's getting people motivated. I think that's very important. Okay. So next item is teamwork, player versus coach. This is actually an, another interesting problem, right? How do you build team, right? I believe complex problem are best solved by team, right? And because individual has easy to put blinders on, right? I can tell you as, 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 as myself, I, I make a lot of mistakes as I'm learning to do things. And I always t tell people, hey, my secret to success, I'm better at making mistakes than you are, I make them faster, right? That, that's a very important aspect of being able to learn. You make mistakes, you learn, you move forward. And when you build a team, is you want an environment that the team feel like they can make mistakes, right? And because you're all in it together. You're not doing a blame game, right? In a big corporation, that happens a lot, right? And I think particularly in a much more traditional Asian environment, you see a lot of situation where, you know, I remember, well, I'll just go right to an example. I remember I was at a studio, I was visiting, I was talking to people, and I saw this artist, she was doing these work, and I walked up to her and I started giving her a critique, right? And which is a normal thing to do in my world because that's the only way you help people improve. You help them point out things that can be better and you give them tips on how they can make it better. And I swear this girl totally thought I was going to fire her right there and then, right? It's just this fear. She's shaking. She's sweating. And, and, and because the perception is the boss would never come to my desk and talk to me. I always go to the boss, right? That's the thinking they have, right? And when I set up an office over there, they asked me, what, what, what furniture, you know, fancy furniture you want in your office? I said, I don't want any fancy furniture. Just give me a big conference table and a big monitor and no paper. Right? The other thing I, I did that upset a lot of people in Asia is I say no paper. They love signing paper. Right? You go to India, you go to China, you go to Hong Kong. It doesn't matter. They love paperwork. Right? And some of you from Asia, you know, right? They love paperwork. And... I walked in and I said, no, this office will not have paper, right? which pissed off a lot of people. But nevertheless, it's about breaking rules. right? Then you start breaking the rules down and get people thinking how they work together. And the fact that your job, the role of the team is player, coach, 
Think about that way. Right? You're, on the, you're playing this game together. You're there to win as a team. It's not about the coach don't win a game. The player wins the game, right? That's how people should be thinking about it in, in, te- in, in this world of mixing technology and creativity. And I think that's the, some of the learning experience in terms of getting people to going from this vertical management structure to this team format where they understand, okay, the boss may be the coach, but at the end it's a team that wins, right? the player that wins. And the coach is there to facilitate, help the team be successful. And I really think that's a really good way of thinking about it because everybody understands sports. And then using that as an analogy, I think, helped break some of that ground of this traditional, very vertical infrastructure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy because the fact that somebody several level above you would actually come talk to you is like shocking to some people in some of the places I've been to. And, and, I, and I find it really difficult because I, I'm used to in the studio environment that, you know, I can go talk to anybody and everybody, anybody can talk to anybody. And, but in some of these environments where you have to break that struct, vertical structure and flatten it out is also a big challenge. And, and another area that I think is very interesting is people, more or less. This is our interest. Uh, and, and I have to look at it, it's probably confusing for people. Okay, you get to an in environment where labor is cheap. For example, when I first went to India in the early 2000s, labor was very cheap, so we tend to throw a lot more people in the project. It was like that in China. But let me tell you, you know, you live in Shanghai or Beijing or Mumbai nowadays, it's not cheap, okay? A well-educated student coming out of school is paid very well, and the cost of living is very high. You know, housing costs in some of these cities exceeds even Silicon Valley. So the, the cost factor is gone. But they still have the historical thinking that, hey, we just throw a lot of people in it, right? And that's a very natural solution. Right? I just remember work, working with one place that I was working off with. I went in there and they're like, you're going to hire 200 people. I said, why are you hiring 200 people? They said, well, we need to do this other work. I say, there's other way of looking at this problem, right? Throwing people in it is sort of a numerical solution, but it's not necessarily the proper solution, right? What problem you're trying to solve, is it really a number game, right? The, the, the tendency is to throw more people on it. And there's certain plus and minus to that, right? Uh, in this environment, where we are like, you know, we're in Silicon Valley here, you can have a few very bright people and come up with a very, very innovative solution if they work well together as a small team because they have a tremendous experience behind them. So in an environment where you don't have that depth of experience, actually to your advantage to throw a lot of people in it, right? So the, the smaller team may get to that answer with fewer F try because they have the experience, but the team that don't have the experience with more of them, they actually can probably beat this team because there's more people trying out different things. So that sheer number do have certain advantage when you suddenly want to jump somewhere. Right? The problem is, these teams, when you have this massive number of people working on something in parallel to beat the odds, there's no continuity of knowledge, right? You're not retaining that in a meaningful way. Versus the people who've been working for many years have retained that knowledge, and that wisdom is in a much more serviceable form. Versus this now is scatter, right? Okay, one team did the right thing, the rest, gone, then this team goes forward. Then all the mistakes everybody made are lost, right? But that mistake is just as valuable as the success in many ways in my mind as a, from a business perspective, right? Because you don't want to make those same mistakes again. So that's, saying, that's why I think the, the people, more or less people question has a, people don't think through it enough, to, I think, to address some of the problems that might arise from that. Okay, and the other problem with when you throw a lot of people, when you hire a lot of people, it's easy to hire a lot of people, right? In, in, in Asia, there's a lot of resource. I mean, I, I got some astounding number the other day. They said currently in the school system in China alone, there are 500,000 students studying digital arts. So people who make games and movies and digital arts, 500,000, right? That's an amazing number, but the question, there's not 500,000 jobs out there, right? 
So, so yeah, so you can be a high lot of people and throw them at it. But that creates another problem too. Uh, this is a more human problem, right? The problem is about how people interact together when you're in a large team. When there's a four, few of us in a team, you understand each of us' personality, you understand each of our strength and weakness very well because it's a close proximity. Even though you're far away, you have to only learn a few person. It's easy to grok that strength and weakness within your team. But you have a big team, it's hard. How do I know this weak, if, you know, there's five of us in this room, I can probably figure it out pretty quickly. But there's 200 of us, it's gonna take a long time to understand all the strength and weakness, right? The success of your team is to be able to cover all your weakness among yourself, so you don't have that hole to fall into. And with a bigger team, it's harder to do that. And the other thing, because we're a social animal, is when the big team you have, you now have suddenly formed more pockets of politics, okay? Then people now will congregate into their own group, their own way of thinking. And, and from a management perspective, that's your worst nightmare, right? When you have a large team that now suddenly people have certain leanings, certain way of thinking. You know, in technology, you're trying to not think about things like that. Okay, things are very objective. But the end is very subjective, right? You go to any big company now, you can see the politics. You see how people uh, who, who socialize together think differently than this other group that think together. So you, just because you have more people, you actually help create this other problem of the social problem of having people with different leaning and groups. And from a management perspective, next thing you know, you're playing the UN, which is not a great model anyway, to now navigate groups of people instead of individual. So that, that's actually a very difficult challenge in working in this space. So, number people is important. It's the highest priority you should put into building any enterprise in, in the new area. So some of these issues, uh, not just you know, in Asia or anywhere else, it happens here too. But I think the end is really focused on understanding how to best put a team together and, and understand that numbers doesn't mean a better solution or, and understanding the management. Particularly in the, some of the problem I will explain to you later that I tried to do, and it, it was tr tricky. Okay, and then, Last item regarding working, you know, in a foreign land, it's culture. You know, you respect, or you, is it a, what, a, a mistake, right? It's a, and again, this phrase that totally could be misleading. I always, you know, I'm, I'm a geeky guy, you know, watch Star Trek all my life. I always say, when you go work overseas, you work somewhere, you need to have that model from Star Trek, non-interference, right? You don't want to interfere with the culture. You want to let them don't disturb their, their evolution. But, you know, guess what? Most companies are colonials. Uh, they they go, 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 go over there and they say, oh, when you set up a company, this is how you can do things. You don't know how to do it. We're going to tell you how to do it. And this is how things can be done. And colonialism doesn't work in the long term. It might get you something going very quickly, but the end, you want to build people who are thinking for you, right? A successful company require every employee to be thinking for the long-term goal of the company to be successful. All, every one of them have to be creatively thinking, engage in what you're doing, to respect what you're doing, and participate in the process. If you go in there being, you know, like, you know, set up a colony, that doesn't work that way. So I think it, what I did when I set up studio out there was went in there with the very clear mindset that I'm there to help. I'm not there to tell you how to do things. I mean, in fact, they do expect you, want you to tell them what to, how to do things because that's what they're used to seeing. And it, it was a bit of a struggle initially to say, look, I'm not really here to tell you how to do things. I can, but I won't. Because if I do that, then you're going to all look at it and say, well, that's, you told us to do things that way, but it doesn't work here, it's your fault. We're all in this together. We need all need to learn. I'm there to help understand how you work, understand your challenges, and understand how to improve your process. And you need to participate in teaching me what's important to you so I can help you. 
And so it's not just going there and dictating. And, and that, that's, I think, it takes a effort. I made several of that effort. I've seen other people done that very successfully. And having that respect, not necessarily to culture, but to people, I think goes a long way. I have worked with many people who have been very successful throughout Asia over the years, and they still remain very good friends, because they knew it was a, a, it's not a, I didn't come in as like somebody telling them what to do, but rather somebody who helped them elevate what they can do. And that's very important. And the other thing I'll go back to, which was I think still the biggest challenge, is telling people to do things, but also telling them to understand that mistake is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Is, is you know, having grew up Chinese, with ch Chinese parents, luckily I had an entrepreneurial mom who started her own business and all that, and she taught me it's okay to make mistakes. And that's very rare in Asian culture, right, to accept mistakes. In fact, you know, people are chastised for making mistakes, even in company. I've seen that happen. It's like, it's just shocking to me, but I'm not used to it. And, but when you're on the cutting edge of change, when you're applying a lot of new things that people never experimented before, you want people to do things they're never comfortable doing, and they'll be less comfortable if they're fearful that they'll make a mistake, you have to really open up and say, look, guys, I don't know what I'm doing either, right? But rarely will you find a boss in Asia that will go to their team and say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. That'll never happen, right? They'll go in there and play the boss, right? And that doesn't quite work when you're on the cutting edge. When you want to do something that challenged the team to think outside the box, you have to get them to believe that you are just as much in that space as they are. We're all in it together. And learning to make mistakes is a very hard thing to do in a lot of Asian countries. And uh, it's hard. I mean, like, I remember there's meetings where I went to. I remember I went to a big studio meeting in Japan. It was a creative meeting. And one of the biggest studios in Japan, game studio. And we went to this huge office building with the biggest meeting room I've ever been in. And it's supposed to be a creative meeting. I walked in there. There was not a single artwork on the wall. No projector, no screen. And then we sat through the meeting and the boss came in and talked for an hour. That was supposed to be a creative meeting. It wasn't a team effort. It was one guy telling everybody what he thinks. But that, that doesn't work for me, right? It, it's really about, it's, I always tell this, tell my team, right? I always tell my team in the old days, I say, look, we, we, we're in the, doing things that I'm not necessarily how to do, but I truly believe that and none of us know how to do it, but if all of us put our head together, there's nothing we can't do, right? You have to think that way. But to, to do that, you have to admit to the team that you don't really know what's going on and you need them to all work, participate and work on it. And that's a challenging thing to do, I think, in, in a lot of Asian culture, to have that being humble and being realistic about the situation, being open about it, right? Having that voice, having that integrity to get up and say, look, we are stepping in the new ground and we're all going to work, walk in it together and hold, hold each other's hand and make sure we are successful. I think that's very important. And breaking down the flat structure and making it horizontal and getting people to talk. I think that's very important. So I'll, I'll go through and talk about some of the things I've done that made it was very a uh, learning experience. Here's a studio I work with, founded by a guy named Harley. And he's found a studio called uh, Original Force. We, I sort of gave him a little help. I take really no credit for it, mostly his doing. He was the first studio in China to actually take on a foreign project from overseas and landed a project globally. And they did the work for How to Train Your Dragon for DreamWorks. And you might say, hey, you used to work at DreamWorks, you helped them get the job. But it turns out I stayed completely out of the picture, out of the background. DreamWorks didn't even know I was involved with Holly till after he landed the project. But it was a case where you have an individual, he was like one of the first person in China to learn a certain skill, actually became a teacher for one of the tools used in their computer graphic 
tool set. And he built a studio from scratch. He knew how to, the nuts and bolts work, and he went from an individual to building up to a large studio, and he had full appreciation for all the difficulties. He understand when his team come to him with problems, what those problems are. He just didn't just tell them, say, go fix it, but rather, let's all sit around, understand the problem, let's solve the problem together. And he was very, really, he has been very successful in building a studio because he came from the school of building it from the ground up. He understood the steps, he understood the difficulty. And I think finding that type of people would help you tremendously in building any in new, new venture. Because you want people who actually gone through it, just because you have some, obviously you need a lot of bright young kids, right? That's not the issue. But you still need people who have that depth of experience because they would help take all the things they're hearing and shape them the right form and feed it back to the team. The other thing I did, I was working with a studio called Next Media Animation. I actually stepped in the interim CEO for a year there. And they did a lot of these animated news stories and you know, had pretty good funding. But I went in there and I said, wow, you, know, you have all this resource. What are you going to do with all this stuff? I actually bought a light stage, you know, the only light stage that exists outside of the US. And, but they weren't really doing that much with all this stuff. They were still making these very low-end animated news story to, you know, that some of you probably seen on the internet. I said, okay, let's take this chance to take a group of people who have amazing background. Right? There are a lot of them very well educated. There are a lot of animators. I said, okay, let's push as far as we can. You know, I, I got to know the owner very well, and I, I, I've served as CEO for a year. I said, look, let's, let's take it from a different perspective. I got in there, put on my hat, and I said, okay, let's go to work. And I brought along all my experience, plus all that I've learned about what not to do, and trying to see if I can make a difference, right? And we end up building a lot of very interesting things. We actually built a real-time production pipeline. We can do a real-time CG show streamed to the internet, uh, which, which was pretty amazing. I mean, we did a field test episode where we actually, when you see some of that here, we had a writing team sitting there um, on teleprompter, changing the story as we're getting real-time feedback from the audience, right? All the stuff I talked about earlier, we actually did, you know? And in an environment that wasn't quite obvious it was doable, but we got to work because the people are smart. It's just building the team, giving the encouragement, giving them the right set of circumstances and the training and the, and the direction that helped them put their effort together. So we were able to do a real-time show. We, did, we built a real-time pipeline. We, we, you know, we were teleprompt. The writer was actually getting feedback over the internet, and they would change the script as the show was going on. And that was so exciting to see. We've done a few test episodes. We, but we had to do this for cheap, right? Don't forget, this is in Asia. We, we can't do it the Hollywood way. Right? I can't spend millions of dollars. This has to be done on a shoestring budget. So we came up with a system, right? We, we had a really good tech team that, that were very well versed, you know, led, led by you know, a group of people that had a very good technical background. So, but combining all my experience of things that we shouldn't be doing. And I had to unlearn all the stuff I learned too, right? Because if I started doing this project back in the studio in the US, this would have never got off the ground. People would just look at it and go, you're crazy, right? How can you do this? And, and to do it at that cost efficiency model was just too far beyond the, the business model of studio here. So I went in there and said, okay, I'm going to unlearn everything. I'm, you guys are going to learn new things. I'm going to unlearn everything I know. And that's how we work together, right? We level the playing field. I went in there learning something new. They were in learning something they didn't know. And then we put the team together and we got done. It was a very tight schedule and it's doable. I think the key is respecting what everybody brings to the table. Right, and respecting the whole issue of management and what's the role player coach versus boss. Right? I think that, that itself is very important. And then having people participate and have fun doing it. Right? Because it's so easy to work in a big company in, in, in the environment in that space where you just, it's a job. Right? 
I don't think anybody should take work as just a job. You do something because you're proud of what you do, and you work with the people that make it better, right? Even in manufacturing or any type of work you do, you, you have to go in with the right attitude that you want to make it better so the company become more successful. And, and it's interesting because my, my mom had a manufacturing business. So people would say, hey, you come from the high-end film business, you don't get this stuff. My mom has had a manufacturing company in Asia when I was a kid. And I saw how she ran the company. She treated everybody the same, right? It's not that vertical. And, and because of that, I learned to do that. And I think you can break a lot of that ground in working in Asia and working in this creative field as we're moving toward this new entertainment industry and the mobile device and more directly connecting the audience. You need to build a lot more teams that can be much more dynamic because now we need to change what we're doing every day. It's no longer finish it, wrap it up, ship it, and put it in a truck and ship it, right? Because I am now live with each of you as a consumer, as a content creator, as a technologist. I am now in connection with you on a daily basis. How you think, how you feel will reflect upon my success in your world. So if I don't pay attention to it, I don't build a business around that, that support that, I will fail. So the key is, you know, you, you need to build company and people that understand that dynamic. So in all the years in working in big studio, I have I learned everything, and now I'm learning a whole new set of rules and building a whole new set of technology and working with new rules that hopefully can break those grounds. So thank you. I'll just skip. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so your comment about the artist that was uh, unhappy with your comments. Um, how do you cross that barrier? I mean, can you, can you explain to somebody that? that yeah, uh, I can you talk about that. Initially, you know, she was like shocked. I mean, she was ready to pack her desk up and head out the door, right? That's usually how things would happen if a boss comes to your desk in some part of the world. And at the end, basically at the end is spending the time. It takes time, right? And you get to talk about not, it's, it's your voice. When I'm sitting down with somebody and talking about their work, initially, you know, if they're used to bosses telling them this is bad, this is bad, 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 I ask questions. I'm having a dialogue. It's not no longer just me dictating certain things, but it's having dialogue. I say, hey, wow, you know, I think this could be better this way. How do you do it? Well, have you tried this, right? Once you have a dialogue, then they realize that you are there to help them, then the table is completely turned, right? Now they realize, wow, you're a resource to help me be more successful. I mean, it takes time. And th th I think that that's the thing, right? It's, it's easy to go in there, you know, being the big boss, being washing around with people, you know, you know, bow, kowtowing to you. Right? I still remember visiting one big company in Asia somewhere, I won't mention the name, where by the time I got off the call, by the time I got into the CEO's office, had to be like 70 people bow to me, right? That was really awkward, right? Okay, I, I'm, you know, too, and, and that doesn't work for me, okay? I, I really believe it's really, no matter what level you add, you need to be in contact with the people in a personal level, right? At the end, we are just people. We have our own flaw. We have our own reason why we do things. And you have to understand people. You know, to build a strong team, you know, everybody to look after each other, right? And I can tell you, all the years when I built all my early companies, I know my team are always looking after me because they know I'm looking after them, right? And, and th that's how it has to change. So how long does it take to, <laughs> to convince somebody that, that it's you're It's easier not for me because I come, come from a, we're in sort of a creative technology industry. I can break the ice much easily. I can sit down with somebody, I break a pencil and paper, I start drawing. Once they see that I'm there doing the same thing they're doing, the wall comes down, right? Like I work with program, I still write a lot of code myself, okay, I admit, I'm a geek, right? And when I deal with technology people, 
You know, instead of telling them, barking them to say, hey, you got to make this faster, better. I sit down and say, hey, let, let's try this thing. Right? I go write some code. We exchange ideas. And then, then the conversation starts flowing. Right? It, it takes a lot, multiple tries, right? Not always. I think it's so easy for them to fall back to their way of doing things when I'm not there, right? I hear those stories all the time. Say, hey, when you're not there, things will slow down, right? And, and it's the key is finding people. I work with a great team. I have a team in Singapore. You know, I have some, there's people like better, much better than I in dealing with this issue out there. But they're not easy to find, right? So you find people like that, and you just put them in the right place. Uh, at the end, is is really understanding. No, you just can't go in there and expect things a certain way. You know, that's the first thing I learned, right? Even being Asian, I walk in there, they don't treat me like Asian. They treat me like a total alien from another planet, right? So I have to go in there and step back, lower myself, and calm down and listen. And then understand their challenges and be able to reflect upon that and be able to offer solution, not just dictate, right? Okay, let's, take, let's go to the other end of the same thing. You've succeeded with right. somebody and they're collaborative, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now they want to go and they say, you know, great, I'm going to go off and I'm going to get a job at another company in the same area and they're unemployable because they don't fit the culture anymore. You said prime directive, but the first thing you do is you completely change their culture. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. The prime directive is to not to change the culture, but help them, right? When I go sit down with somebody, but help. It, yeah. It's helping, helping them. You can't be helped unless you change. Right. Help us change. That, that's change. why my slide there says CCC, right? <laughs> culture, challenge, challenge, culture, and change. The change has to be from them, not from me. If I change them, then it won't work. They have to evolve and change on their own, right? And it's a t tricky balance, right? But hopefully these people who do that will move out and be successful, right? It's interesting. Actually, you bring up a very interesting point. All my years of building companies and working with people, my proudest thing is not what I have done, but what people have worked with me have done on their own outside, right? To me, that's a better legacy because you realize now you have passed it on something that's of great value, right? And it works in subtle way. I mean, I'll tell you another story. There's a guy that came to work for me at PDI, a Japanese modeler. He showed up, got the job, and I wasn't involved in interviewing. And he came up to me and he said, I want to thank you. He came into my office and he bowed. I go, wow, why did you do that? I don't remember hiring you. He go, no, you may not remember me. But like 10 years ago or some distance ago, you were, I was your interpreter when you were directing a commercial in Japan. I used to direct commercial in Japan, right? He, I, and he said, look, this is a long time ago. You probably don't remember me. I was a young kid back then. We were sitting in a car in a rainstorm. We couldn't shoot because we were stuck in the rain. And you know, you sit in a car, I'm sitting in a car, my interpreter, we were just chatting. And I barely remember the incident. But he told me what happened. He said, look, you were the first person in my life that told me it's OK to make a mistake. That completely changed my life. He came from a very traditional Japanese family, went to school, learned everything very strict. Things had been done perfectly well, right? I didn't tell him to change, but he heard one thing that I talked about about myself that he carried with him and totally changed his life. He said through that, he moved out of this traditional model where he's supposed to be heading, and he became through something he had a passion for. He learned to create things. He went, became a CG modeler. It was a very moving story for me. It's like, wow, you know, I, I didn't came here to change you, but because of what I did, you found a way to change that better yourself. That was very satisfying. But, but again, you know, yes. But, but you, you did change. Sure. But you did yeah. pollute the atmosphere. Pollute the atmosphere, yes. <laughs> Just like Kirk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I left a phaser in the forest there or something. He broke all the rules, right? Yeah. You're talking about a difference between Western culture and Asian culture in the way they handle things. But it seems like there may also be a difference in the extent to which there is a cultural inertia 
Um, I went through 20 years of education, um, hierarchical system, professors above students and so forth. I got my first job for a relative startup in California and they immediately said, here's our culprit corporate culture. It's okay to fail. It's okay to argue. If yeah. your boss says something you disagree with, tell him why you disagree. It's if the vice president of the company says something you disagree with, tell him. You, know, you won't be punished for any of these things. Take initiative. Don't keep asking permission. Find your own solutions. And I said, oh, okay, that's fine. I'm fresh out of school, so that's how corporations work. I get the feeling that uh, an Asian student that went through that same kind of cultural training from what you're saying, would revert, you know, not really pay attention or not really believe it, or tend to revert back to what they had thought the culture should be. Yeah, it's hard. It's um, I give you an interesting story. I was always challenged by the difficulty in finding good management in China, right? Because China always had one-child policy, so you get this one kid who is very, you know, well taken care of. Most of them very spoiled by their parents, and they grew up on their own in the family, very protective family, and they very well educated and do very well. But then they never had certain thing missing from their management skill. So one time I was meeting up with one guy, I think at some conference, and he was introduced to me by a friend. I sat down and talked. I go, wow, you have all the skills that I'm looking for in a manager. What makes you different than every other people I've met from your age group coming out of China? And we sat and talked for like half a day. And everything, I, I, I went down every path, like you've done this, you've done this, done this, yes, yes. So I'm taking all these notes, right? Turns out at the end, the one thing that made him different was he grew up in an orphanage. He grew up sharing and making sacrifice, okay? That was a very important aspect of understanding how people work, right? He had all the attribute what I want in a manager, somebody who understands, listen, knows how to balance things, versus just about me. Right? It, was, it was just shocking when I realized that, right? But that, clar that clarity in the problem was, was a revelation for me. And from that point, I realized, okay, then you need to understand where people come from, all the baggage they came with and the plus they came with. And you can't, you know, you can't just dictate the change, right? You have to build an environment that they feel like they can change, right? If the, if the environment revert back to something they're familiar with, they'll go back to where they were, right? I always said, particularly in my industry, right? I need people to take creative risk. People will only take creative risk and make that jump if they feel like if they jump and fall, you're there to pick them back up. Risk taking totally based on the support structure you have, right? Little kids would take risks because the parents there protect them. But you don't want to overprotect them, but you want to create just an environment where they can take that risk, right? So I think the, the, the key is not necessarily going in there and making drastic change, but provide an environment where people can feel comfortable enough to take that leap and make the change. I think that's important. Yeah, we've talked a lot about creativity. Uh, how have some Asian companies like uh, Nintendo uh, done pretty well in the last 30 years in this creative space? Is it despite like you know the, the structures in Japanese companies, or do they just have no. amazing game designers that just got lucky, or how'd that work? One thing the Japanese culture is, I have great more respect from because I learned most of my art from drawing manga when I was a kid. Is they have a culturally very supportive of creative people. They are very honored, they're respected in their culture, they have a very long history of it, right? Uh, you know, I have a lot of friends who are very famous uh, comic book well, manga designer in Japan. I mean, you know, you walk with them on the street, they're like treated like God, right? Because their creativity as a, is very valuable. I think that's one of the culture in, in, in Asia that where the creative people are awaited as well, uh, highly, more so than a lot of other country, right? And I think that was a great learning experience too. I think Japan's a good exception to that. <laughs>